Brothers and sisters, when we commit sin, we bring an abominable stain upon our spiritual, I would almost say avatars, but our the representation of who and what we are in the spirit realm. Um, we have a spiritual man, an inner man who is exactly like our outer man. He doesn't, he doesn't look like anybody else. He looks like you for you and me for me, but he is a spirit being. And this being is always before the Lord. You know, uh, sometimes he's represented in the Old Testament in the Psalms as a candle. You know, the spirit of a man is a candle of the Lord, meaning that the spirit that is inside you actually lights you up. He serves as an internal lighting system. And by that lighting system, which you cannot affect remotely, God is able to read all humanity at all times. This is why none of us will ever be able to stand in front of God and say, Oh God, I feel you're judging me unfairly. Oh God, I feel that this is not fair. You're accusing me of things I never did. We will not be able to get away with that when we stand before God at the end of time. And the reason for that is because the spirit of a man within him is the candle of the Lord. The Lord can see your human spirit as clearly as you can see me in the, this video. You cannot hide anything from the Lord. And so when we commit sin or when we harbor sin, or even when there is sin in us and we are unaware of it because it's possible to have sin in your heart it's possible to have sin in your mind it's possible to harbor lusts in your mind desires in your mind things that you want to do and they operate in the background of your psyche and the background of your soul and spirit pretty much like uh you know how you can you can be typing on a computer and you your screensaver comes on and then you only see the, the screensaver but you don't actually see what's going on in the background but things are happening in the background and you may have sin, I may have sin in my life, or it could be active willful sin, you know, rebellion, refusal to change, refusal to be teachable, having a hard heart, pride, lust, fornications, adulteries, uh, murder can lurk in our hearts, you know, many times. So repentance is a privilege from God. And this is strange because in this modern generation, repentance is grossly misrepresented and people actually hate repentance. There is nothing Christians hate more than to be told you need to repent. It, it's so strange because the whole process of becoming a Christian starts with repentance. And repentance has been grossly mistaught. Um, when I was coming up in church, I kept hearing uh, this phrase, oh, repentance is when you miss the mark, so you need to imagine a target and then imagine that you're trying to shoot an arrow at the target, but you miss the mark, you know? And so when you've sinned, you've missed the mark and then you need to repent. Brothers and sisters, I just wanna tell you that while this may paint a pretty picture that lines up with modern day Christianity and how we want to practice it today, that is not really an accu accurate representation. When you sin, you literally step away from the Godhead. You step away from your renewed man. You shut the door on the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you isolate yourself in a wasteland where you and Satan begin to slow dance. That is a more accurate picture of sin. When you sin, sin is depicted in the book of Romans so accurately, especially in Romans chapter seven. Sin is depicted in there and also in God's encounter with Cain as a living being. The Lord said to Cain, Sin lies at the door. Sin crouches at the door and its desire is for you. So, so if I have a choice, excuse me, if I have a choice to choose between God's picture of sin and the modern day evangelical Pentecostal born again picture of sin, which is, oh, I in my arrow, I'm trying to shoot that target, but I missed it. And God says there is a wild feral beast crouching just outside the door that represents you and your life. And this thing is alive. It has a consciousness. It can think, it can plan, it can plot, it can stalk and follow you. And its desire, it actually has a heart and it is able to have lust. And its desire is for you. Its desire is to consume you. I don't know about anybody else out there, I'm going with God's picture. God's picture is more honest. God's picture is more representative of what is tracking me in my life and what it wants to do to me. The Apostle Paul says that sin is a taskmaster. Sin will first possess you and then crush you. And when it's crushed you and cowed you, it will rule over you. When we look at repentance, we are actually coming to God to say, receive me back into the Godhead where I am supposed to dwell in communion with you. Receive me back into fellowship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Because Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears me and opens the door, what? My father and I will come in with him. We will suck with him, which is a picture of fellowship, and we will dwell with him. So that man will not be alone. It is necessary to repent from the heart, to humble ourselves, to cry out, to say, God, I am an equal opportunity contributor to the collective sin of America. The sins that I commit here, the sins that you commit where you are, the sins that we commit on the soil of the USA is condemning her in heaven is adding greatly to the weight of charges against her. And that is why personal repentance, not just abstract repentance, God, we as a nation repent. What are you doing in your life? What are those habits that are crouching at your door? What are those habits that have already kicked down the door, moved in and are sitting on the sofa and demanding that you feed them? What are the habits that have completely taken over your life? What are the things that you were struggling with? You don't want to confess them to anyone. You keep bringing them to God. You can't get the victory and you need to pierce those things in the larynx. You need to cut the throat of those sins so that you can be free. And so that when you stand before the father and you make intercession for yourself, for your family, for your friends who are still out in the world and for the nation at loud at large, your voice is actually a loud voice. Your voice is actually heard. Your voice is countenanced by God. God actually says, uh, we've got a live one over there. Count her vote. We want our heavenly vote to be counted. We don't want to be discounted because of sin. There are many people, like I said, people truly hate to hear the word repentance. They feel offended when you tell them um, in counseling or you just tell them as a friend, there is a need here for you to repent. People feel mad. People feel, why should I repent? People feel, what have I done that's so bad that you need to be telling me to repent? And who are you anyway to tell me to repent? Don't judge. If we cannot identify the activities, the habits, the lifestyles, the penchants, and the behavior, the cycles that God says are unrighteous, if we cannot point them out and say, separate from these things, come away from these things, they're killing you, then how on earth are we going to be able to lead anyone or lead ourselves into life eternal? How are we going to be able to point to what is good if we cannot single out and point what is bad? True repentance comes when you are cut to the heart. True repentance is only birthed when you recognize the sinfulness of an action, which is where we get the problem. If someone feels that his or her actions are not sinful, how on earth can it provide, how can it produce godly repentance that leads to healing, that leads to restoration of their soul? Godly repentance will do several things. Let me read them out to you. When you sorrow in a godly manner, it will produce diligence in you. You will become much more diligent about watching for the triggers that lead you into sin because you do not want to have to repeat repentance. What else does it produce? It produces clearing of yourselves. So you begin to search yourself. You begin to search your heart. You begin to search for the appetites inside you. You really begin to question and say, Celestial, what is it that is wrong with you that you keep going back to this sin like a dog to its vomit? You out there, what is it with you? What is the open doorway in your life? What is that sore point that has not received healing and wholeness, has not been brought back to solidity and integrity? And every time you step on that place, it just gives way like a rotten floor and tumbles you back into a sinful behavior. How can you clear yourself, solidify that place so that you can walk across it or avoid it altogether and not fall back into sin? Repentance produces indignation. You become angry at the fact that the devil keeps on snaring you. You become upset that you keep falling for the same sin. You say, how on earth am I, a Christian walking with the Lord this year, you um, this long, you, a Christian walking with the Lord this long, keep repeating the same patterns? How can I overcome it? How can I stop it? Devil, not today. You become indignant that you are being taken for a fool by the enemy. That's another thing that godly sorrow that leads to repentance produces is fear. Now, um, we know that God doesn't want us to have fear. We know that God um, doesn't want us to live in fear. But the fear that Apostle Paul is talking about here is actually the fear of God. Uh, a lot of the times, I personally, me, Celestial, I find 
that God has been greatly sanitized in the church and we do not have the fear of God. And one of the first things that you will notice when there is no fear of God is that sin will increase. Why? Because if you have the right and the proper view of God, not only that he's the reckless love God or, you know, this God that's forever running through the hills and the valleys looking for us to have communion with us, but that he is a king. We're not convicted of sin because we don't fear God. We don't think that he's going to do anything if we sin or we imagine him to be this person of limitless patience. We can just keep sinning and sinning and sinning some more and it doesn't really matter. Brothers and sisters, it's time to get back to the baseline. I'm going to be honest in this broadcast. It is time. It is past time to get back to the baseline. And the baseline is all unrighteous conduct all immoral conduct. This is putting substances in your body that do not belong there. This is pursuing sexual relationships that you have no right to have outside the covenant of marriage. This is stealing. This is lying. This is covetousness. This is abdicating your stewardship when God has given you a position of power or a position of responsibility at your job or a position of responsibility in the government or in um, any place where you are a steward, where you are over other people, um, whether it's in the church or it's in the secular world. If you are trans Transgressing the written law of God, you are out of order, you are in sin, and if you are following any group of people, any crowd of people, any sect of people, or any organization that is telling you, no, we have an alternative reality for you, we have a different truth, and you can just subscribe to what we say, and then you will be free from having to follow the dictates of those religious fanatics, those zealots, I am here to tell you by the Spirit of the Lord that Jesus Christ is cleaning house at this very moment. And guess where he's going to start? That's right. Did somebody put up their hand in the back? Judgment begins at the house of God. There are times when somebody does something to you and they are the cause of your sin. Somebody does something to you that is so painful, so offensive, so wicked, that it, it translates you into a position where you then fall into sin. In the case where, for instance, somebody has been abused or molested, that kind of sin against the human body always opens the door for so many other behaviors that are in and of themselves sinful. And brothers and sisters, we need to come to a place where even the original sin that we are not responsible for, we have to bring it to God. There are a lot of people who won't forgive things that were done to them because the, the attacker or the offender is not sorry. Brothers and sisters, there are people out there with some very wicked hearts. If you are waiting for them to give you an apology, you might be waiting until the Lord comes back. It is very danger, dangerous to tether your life to somebody else's life. When I say tether your life, here's your attacker, here's your offender, and here you are, and you're joined to them by that hatred. See how my two nails are joined to one another? You're joined to them by that hatred that you have for what they did. You're joined to them by that evil act that you suffered by what they did. And you're not able to get free. Everywhere you go, you take them with you. They're out there living their lives. Maybe they're out there molesting more people. Maybe they're out there taking other people's um, 401k. Maybe they're out there scamming other people. But wherever you go, there you are with this person. They're with you when you're waking. They're with you when you're sleeping. They're always in your heart in a very negative way. And the energy that this person has transferred to you by that offensive act that they committed against you eventually can kill you. There are people who have committed suicide because they were not able to untether themselves from the point of trauma, from the point of pain, from the point of heartbreak of what somebody else did to them. So I am saying that sin can even beget more sin when it initially was not your fault. But if we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be made new, we can be made whole. Jesus has restored so many people his track record is impeccable. You are looking at a renewed work. The Lord has restored my heart, my life, my mind, and I am not speaking to you things that I have not undergone. So to go back to the point that I was making, we do not have the fear of God anymore. We have lost respect for the Father. We think that he is just one of us. If we lose the fear of God, and when we hear the truth being shared, we become upset, we become offended, because the words that are being spoken are scratching in our throat. We know it's us. And Satan makes us so offended when we hear the truth. And that is such a travesty. That is such a tragedy. And that's why we hate repentance. It is easier to get angry as a Christian in this generation than to just say, you know what? You got me. I'm 100% guilty. It's me. I'm the one. 
Brothers and sisters, whenever I share about repentance with people, I let them know that I am no stranger to repentance. Nobody came out of their mother's womb white as snow. But I love repentance. When you have truly gone through the process of repentance, there will be a clearance in your soul. And that's the part I love the most. When I feel the sunshine of God's love coming through to me once more, and he's like, you, you little... And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you, God. <laughs> thank you for taking me back. And I'm so happy. And I'm back to my normal self. And uh, that grayness lifts and the little evil violin stops playing, you know, and Satan is sent to the corner. Um, that is the best part of knowing that you have received the Lord's um, forgiveness is that your countenance is just beaming. You're just so joyful. And you're like, Lord, I never want to hurt you like that again. We need to have in mind that God is a person. Part of the reason that repentance is not so loved in the modern church is because we have this ally culture. We do not want to feel bad in this modern world for any reason. Everything that is sold to us and showed to us, the whole point of it is to make us feel good. Even evil is presented as good. And we're so intent on feeling good that we don't want anything that makes us feel bad. And this is why this phrase, don't judge, is so famous now. Because if you say, hey, she shouldn't have done that. Hey, he's wrong for doing that. That's sin. Then everybody's like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. let people enjoy things. And I'm thinking, uh, no, no, that is not what the Bible says. That is not being your brother's keeper. That's not love. We don't want to feel bad. But the process of repentance involves feeling bad. And feeling bad has its uses. You see, feeling bad about your sin actually shows that your heart is not hard. That your heart is still tender and still soft towards the Lord. Feeling bad is the process that gets you to recognize, I don't ever want to feel this way again. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so caught. I'm so poked and pierced with the pains and the conviction of the Holy Spirit letting me know I'm not pleased with this action. But in ally culture, as soon as somebody is guilty, we rush and we're like, no, 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 don't feel bad. God loves you just as you are. Don't you dare feel bad. Don't you feel bad at all. And then before people can sink into the pool of feeling bad, which is where they will actually begin the process of swimming their way to reconciliation with Christ, with healing, going through all the steps of um, godly sorrow and indignation and fear and vindication that eventually proves them guiltless. We reach into that pool and snatch them out before they've even had a chance to get wet. Don't you dare feel bad. Let me dry you off. You haven't done anything. So what if you had an affair? So what if you stole all the church's money? It doesn't matter. We accept you. Godly sorrow will get you on your knees, dialoguing with your maker like David did. So why don't you today spend some time in Psalm 51 and find out what is the godly sorrow that leads to repentance, that leads to salvation? Because I constantly bring the word on my other platform, the Lord Jesus has declared judgment on the nation of America. The Lord Jesus will bring judgment on all the nations of the world. And he said that Christians will not be exempt from those judgments. So we really need to examine our hearts. And that is why this word is entitled Godly Repentance, What God Wants Us to Know. Now, part two. This is Celestial Revival. God bless you and take care. Until next time.